I might have a word of prayer and then I want to jump into the second half of 1 Samuel, which is the period in which David and Saul are both alive. Um, Saul would rather David not be alive. And there's a whole chasing going on, a chase scene. But that's not really what it's about. It's about how God is shaping this incredible king elect to be king when no one's trying to shape him. This is, this is the believer who's being fitted for a position down the road and God is working in his life when the people who should be working in his life to help train him are doing everything but train him. Sometimes you learn from the people that go ahead of you how not to do it. Some of you have decided you're going to be just like your parents. And some of you decided you're just not going to be like them at all. Sometimes the people in front of you tell you exactly how not to do something. Saul was doing a great job of training how not to be king. One of the things that Saul did was uh, start off his life incredibly insecure. We see his insecurity in the day of his coronation. Where was he? He's hiding behind the baggage. And so he doesn't really want to be. However, he's taller than everybody else and there aren't that many baggages that are that big. So eventually they spotted his head moving behind the baggage and said, get him out here. Once they made him king, he sort of stuck with the job. A few things went well for Saul, but the insecurity haunted him. And it was a single song that put him over the edge. One song, a bunch of girls singing a song outside of his window one day, and it was heard by him, and the venom that throbbed through his heart was jealousy. The simple song was, Saul has killed his thousands, David tens of thousands. <gasps> he's more important than I am. Surely he's going to be king. I must be going to die. Panic, panic. And everything goes down from there. Why? Because fear is, the, is a terrible foundation for making decisions. Terrible. You will make the worst decisions of your life when you make them out of fear. If I don't accept him, no other man will love me. Hello, decision made out of fear, not good decision. You know, if we don't buy this right now, someone else might buy it. Hello, bad decision. They made 34,000 cars that look just like it. I'm sure you can find another somewhere. And what happens is we, 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 we start looking at life through the, the glasses of fear. I've got to do something. No, you don't. You, you really don't. You don't have to do anything. Basically, love God, pay taxes, and die are really the only things on your daytimer that you're not going to avoid, okay? So, so everything else is up for grabs. What I want to do is walk into chapter 19 and see if we can sort of see how we look at God's training of David and then look at Saul's rejection, God's training Saul's rejection. And we're going to play that back and forth through the second half of 1 Samuel. By the time you pick up 2 Samuel, you're mourning the death of Saul and David is fitting his crown for the king of Judah for seven years before he's king of all Israel for the next uh, 30 years. I want to talk to you about some characteristics that David learned to possess in chapter 19. And I'm choosing my words carefully. Remember that we looked at 18, 19, and 20, kind of in a skipping the stone across the pond, and we were looking specifically at the idea that uh, David and Jonathan had built this friendship. But, but I left out verses in between. I want to go back to the verses in between and see if I can pick up, like in 19.8 and following, some of the story of what we skipped. In 19.8, we start to look at God's training of David as one of the most complete studies from the ancient world of leader, leadership modeling. Some of you might know that um, there are a number of gurus in our day who go around offering leadership seminars. John Maxwell is one of them, used to be a pastor of a church. Now he goes around and does corporate America stuff, makes a lot more money and enjoys a really good lifestyle. And I think he really enjoys doing it. The bottom line is this. If I were looking for a class on modeling how to become a leader, I would look at God's modeling for David. And it wouldn't be a mentor. It would be God mentoring him. David has to learn. He has to get a sensitive heart. He's got to learn to king it with sheep. Then he's got to learn to king it on the run. And then he's over top of a group of guys who are a bunch of mortgage dodgers and bank robbers. 
So he's got the worst possible followers in the beginning, and eventually he takes over the kingdom, which is full of, full of mortgage dodgers and bank robbers, and he goes on and learns how to deal with them. <clears throat> Drop your eyes into chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, verse 8. And let me just pick up something after we've been talking about Jonathan and David up to verse 7. When there was war again, David went out and fought with the Philistines and defeated them with great slaughter, so that they fled before him. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul, we keep seeing that phrase, as he was sitting in the house with a spear in his hand, and David was sitting playing the harp in his hand. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped out of Saul's presence so that he, was, he stuck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. Michal took the household idol and laid it on the bed and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to, ta to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, bring, up, bring him up to me on his bed, that I may put him to death. When the messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with the quilt of goat's hair at its head. So Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michal said to Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I put you to death? Now David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now, a couple problematic parts to the passage. We'll deal with those in just a minute. But first, I want you to see character traits of David. Pick them out. First, in verse 8, I see faithfulness away from the pressure that is outside the palace. When David is serving Saul, he's serving him faithfully, even though Saul is in unstable. Faithful, the, the test of character of faithfulness is when you're being faithful to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Saul doesn't deserve loyalty, but it's there. David is serving loyally someone who's really acting wretchedly. The other thing I know is in verse 9, like verse 8, faithfulness not only outside the palace, but in verse 9, faithfulness inside the palace. Look at the loyalty he shows inside the palace. David is doing what he needs to do, serving Saul's need, when Saul is obviously uh, deeply out of sorts. And he's got that dark cloud that has come over Saul again. Then you get to verse 10, and I see a third thing, a circumspect view. What's a circumspect view? Circum, around, spect, like spectacles, s watching all the way around. We use the word testimony for the broader idea of a circumspect view. It means what I'm doing, I'm doing paying attention to what others see of what I'm doing. I don't mean in an egotistical way, they're all going to notice me when I walk in the room. Not that way. I mean, am I doing this in a way that not only is right, it appears right. Okay, and where do I see that? Look at verse 10. It says, Saul tried to pin him to the wall. David fled and escaped. What David is doing is keeping, an, he's playing the harp, but watching Saul's hand. One of the character traits that David possesses is being able to pay attention to two things at the same time. He's watching what he's doing, playing skillfully on a harp. This is a harp, in case you're wondering. I'm doing my harp. It's not a hula. Um, at any rate, he's doing a little harp thing, but he's got his eye watching the twitching trigger finger of Saul. Why is that going to be important for a king? Because people are going to be trying to kill him. Now, we can do the, you know, you know the og, the, the, the egg loan, you know, the kingdom, of, uh, the, the fat guy. Uh, we, can, we can do, you know, somebody's going to whip out a sword and try to kill me. That's true, but probably not every day. It's important that you become incredibly an observer of people if you're going to lead. By the way, if you're going to be a counselor, you need to observe people. You need to watch what people do. Um, most people have certain twitches they do when they lie. There are about five of them. If you learn what they are, you can pretty, pretty much pick out people who are telling you things that are not true. I was a happier person before I knew them. <laughs> I really was. 
once you learn what goes on in simple things like facial recognition, you can see things people do and they're telling you a lie. And what bothers me is that very often I can tell that they're telling me a lie. And that's hard because it was easier to just believe people. Some of you really have gotten this far in life. You've got 20 years in life and you just believe people and that's really nice. But a lot of them are lying. So he learns how, it, the, the word paltar is the word for he, he saw and bolted out. In other words, he had his eye on it. As soon as, as, soon as Saul made a move, he was, that, that, that harp hadn't hit the floor and he was already out the door, okay? There, there's a fourth one I want you to pay attention to. It's at the end of verse 10. The word noose is the word to slip out and vanish. Let's say it this way. David knew how to make an exit. He knew how to retreat. You, got, you have to know when to fold them. You do. You have to know when not to fight. There are times when you have to run. A good character trait for people who would lead and follow God is to know when to run. Let me offer you one. For some reason, we've mixed up two verses in Scripture and it messes us up. What we do is we try to resist temptation and flee the devil. But the Bible says flee temptation and resist the devil. In other words, when it's the enemy you're looking at, you don't run. That's why the armor is only on the front of you. <laughs> Turning around and running is a bad idea. Okay? But temptation, here's what we do. We try to go, I can stiffen it out. No, run. When, when, when God provides a way of escape, what should you do with it? Escape, that's what it's for, okay? Guys, I don't know why it is, but some people put themselves back into temptation over and over and over and think they can just get through it. That's just what I'd call stupid, okay? If you know a certain person, tempts you to gossip, here's my advice. Stay away from them. Put yourself with them only when there are people, oh, people are exchanging glances, uh-oh. Um, or, or only be with them when you're with other people, where you can make it hard to do that. Does that make sense? If there's a person that you struggle with in your relationship, don't be alone with them. Don't, be, don't create for yourself something, well, I can get through this time. How's that working for you? So I think that that fourth one is important. Let me go on to verses 11 to 17. I see him turning to Michal as a simple character trait. Let me try this one. David develops relationships that he is able to trust. He relies on people who care for him. Now, there's two things involved in that character trait. One of them is you have to learn who's really, who really cares for you or who cares for you because of what you do for them. Those are not the same thing. And the second one is you have to know how heavy you can place weight on relying on someone. Don't ask somebody to do more than they can do. Let me give you an example. If you have a person, a friend of yours, who you know is a chicken for pain, this is not the person you'd want to tell your whole escape plan to and then have them put the hot lights on. If they're a chicken for pain, as soon as they hear the dentist drill, they're going to give you up, okay? So you don't tell them where you're going or you tell them the wrong thing or whatever. I don't know what the escape is. The point is that in this case, you've got to be able to trust people, but you have to trust them only to the level that they can, they can handle it. It's unwise for you to place people in a situation that's beyond what they are in. Now, you might be troubled by Michal and her household God. If you're not troubled by Michal and her household God, there's something wrong with you, okay? So we need to do something else. Here's the bottom line. Michal has a separate chamber in her, in the dwelling, than David does. That's very common in the ancient world. This is not David and Michal's bedroom. That would be true if it was like a 21st century soap opera. This is not. Back in this time, this is Michal's room. David goes into his wife means he goes into her room, okay? And Michal has set this up. She evidently has some kind of large household god in her room. 
This isn't unusual. We find them in the biblical period all the time in archaeological excavations. Usually they're small amulets. I'm assuming that they didn't think, you know, that little lump was David. So it must have been something pretty big. Personally, I would have used pillows, but, you know, I'm not in the story. So here's what I can tell you. Don't put on David the fact that Michal has one of these in her room. Put, on, put it on Michal. In other words, David may be walking with God. That doesn't mean he has the impact in the rest of Saul's family. Because David isn't the operative person in the story. I know it sounds funny, but, you know, it sounds like, well, he's the husband. No, he's the husband of the princess. That's a different thing. So David isn't running what's going on in the house. Saul's running what's going on in the house. Michal has a house and David is added to it. Michal comes into David's life because Saul puts David there. I want you to make Saul the major player, Michal a major player, and David an appendage. He's the guy who, you know, is expendable in the story. Because for the household of Saul, that's the royal family. You have these even today in England. You have the people who were born in the line and then the people that marry them. And the, the press loves to go after the people that marry them, but the fact of the matter is the line is the line. Okay? So watch out what she's doing. What does it tell you about Michal and her personal walk with God? She loves somebody who has a walk with God, but she doesn't necessarily have one. Which, by the way, is one of the problems. One of the problems of David's life is going to, his biggest problem in life is going to be his children. Why? Because who you marry and who you have babies with are, is going to have a direct impact on not only the nose of the baby, but the character of the baby. It's, it's all going to work together. So here's the thing. Reliance of those who cared on him. Look at verses 18 and 19. I think what's interesting is he runs right to who? Who's he run to? Samuel. So I call it reliance on spiritual mentors. I think that it's not only necessary that as a spiritual trait you learn when to run, it's necessary that you learn to where to run to. To run to a spiritual mentor is the right thing to do. David goes to someone who knows God. I don't know why it is, but all, all kinds of people try to find God's solution to their life by asking people who don't know God. That doesn't seem to be a very good plan to me. If, if you want God's will for your life, don't ask Oprah. Don't ask Dr. Phil. Don't, don't run around asking 10 people at the local bar. They probably don't know. But if you've got spiritual mentors, people who know God and walk with God. For instance, you're struggling in a young marriage. Where would you go? I would recommend you go to some family member who has a godly marriage, who cares deeply about you, but also has done it. Don't go to somebody who's your own age who has the equal problem you have. And one of the things we have to do, grow out of your teen years. As a teenager, you totally mistook your peers as closer to you than your parents. Your peers are as dumb as you, okay? That means they don't know the answer. So go to people who actually have been doing it. And I would say, look for people who really know and walk with God. Let me go on and say this in verses 20 to 24. It says, then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. One of the hilarious parts about Saul's life is this dropping prophecy thing that keeps happening. It happened to Saul. Now it happens here. It's, it's, it's almost comical. He like sends in these guys, let's go get them. And the next thing they're doing is dropping in praise and prophesying. It's very distracting to the story. At any rate, when you get down to verse 21, when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. They also prophesied. So Saul sent messengers a third time and they also prophesied. Saul, well, you get a clue already. You're going to have an entire prophesying army if you keep this up. This isn't going to do anything. Saul is insisting that he can, through his own sheer physical power, turn back what God is doing, and it's not going to work. This is a continued sign of resistance in Saul's heart. Make no mistake about it. See, when you start off walking with God, then you depart from walking with God, you become against those who are walking with God. Just remember this, when wrong becomes right, right becomes wrong. 
And what's happening in Saul's life is he started off being one who prophesied. Then he walked away from God and a prophet looked at him and said, you're done. Now he's against those who are prophesying so that he can get his way. The opposite of revelation and yieldedness is selfishness. And what he's doing is moving from the time God used him to reveal his truth in prophecy to the time when he's going to resist God and get his own way. Now, the problem is you can only get your own way if God lets you. So, so everybody's, you know, now that he's got three groups of prophesying men there, what's he going to do? Then he himself went to Ramah and came as far as the large well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, where is Samuel and David? And someone said, behold, they are in Naot in Ramah. He proceeded there to Naot and Ramah. The Spirit of God came upon him also, so that he went along prophesying continually until he came <clears throat> to Naot and Ramah. He also stripped off his clothes, and he true prophesied before Samuel, and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? This is the second time they're saying, this Saul, you know, he goes from being this dark, clouded, spear-chucking individual to back to the prophets, okay? Here's the thing. God's desire to encounter Saul wasn't completed when Saul desired to no longer encounter God. You can run from God. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful at it. So let me look at this from David's standpoint. Not only was he relying on spiritual mentors, but I put in 20 to 24, relying on the power of God to solve problems that are beyond his ability. Because here's the thing. Saul's coming after David, right? What does he want? What does he want? Why, why is he sending three groups of guys who become prophets and then walking up there himself? What, what does he want? He wants David's head on a stick. So can David stop him? Saul's the king. David's the son-in-law. Saul has the army. David's got Samuel. Can David stop Saul? No, but God can. So he runs to the place where God will either save him or not. Remember, I, by the way, why did he choose Samuel? Why not another prophet? Why, why did he go to Samuel's face? What do you suppose he needed to hear from Samuel more than anything else that day? You really are going to become king. Good. I think he needed a reassurance like, Saul's like trying to kill me and I remember you poured that oil on me and I'm just kind of checking in here. Is there still, is there any other plan? Am I like going to lose it? And Samuel goes, no, you're going to be king. And here's the thing, Saul's not going to kill you. And I'm really disappointed about Saul, too, because let me tell you, Dave, long before you, there's a long backstory between me and Saul. And they, I'm sure they probably sat down and had a few tears together. And Samuel had to say to him, here's, here's one. Samuel will turn and put his arm around David and say, he's not rejecting you. He's rejecting God. And Samuel's going to sound really wise, right? Except for God had to tell Samuel that just a few chapters ago. I get to do that. You walk, in, you know, walk into me and you ask me a question, and I get to tell you things that God taught me the hard way, and I get to look smart. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I wasn't smart. I, went, I got all the bumps, bruises, scrapes, and scars to prove it. The fact of the matter is, after a long time of walking with God, you just learn stuff. Even really hard-headed people like me learn stuff. Now, how did David learn to walk this way? I, just, I walked you through this whole thing. I want you to go to a psalm for a minute. I want you to go to Psalm 26, because I think what happens is when we focus on God's purpose and God's sovereign right to be pleased in all things, all of our problems gain the right perspective. Psalm 26, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop and take a look at the psalm for a second, because I think it really reflects, you know, hot hits from Dave on how I got where I am. And... Uh, first of all, let me just say this. The psalm itself is constructed so that the box should be put around verse 12. Okay? My foot shall stand on a level place in the congregations. I shall bless the Lord. I want you to hear seven things God asked, uh, that, uh, that David asked God to do. Okay? These seven things show you something about how his heart was shaped. First, 
I want you to look at, vindicate me, O Lord. That's the word shafat. That's the word judge. David set a standard. And the standard was, God, you judge my heart. Look at my heart. You tell me what you see. Why is that an important part of someone who would become godly? God, here's my heart. You judge it. Why is that an important thing? Shafat, by the word, the word shofet is judge. Shafat is the word for clarify. It's, the word, it's a wine term for seeing clearly through the wine. What is David saying when he says, vindicate me, O God? Look at my heart. Look all the way through it. What is he doing? Come on, this is a softball. This is easy. Yeah, I, if I'm wrong, you show me. Because here's the thing. I really don't believe I'm wrong. No one ever says, here, examine me, if they think that they have something wrong with them, right? They fix it first, then say that. So he says, all right, do an inspection. Verse, two, verse, uh, verse 1 says, for I have walked in my integrity. That is, I believe that I have walked straight. And I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. I believe not only if I walk straight, but if you go back and look, Lord, I've been trusting you the whole path. You look at my heart. You, you judge my heart and you tell me if that's not the way it really is. And then he says in verse 2, I want you to bohan. Bohan is to examine. I want you to, <clears throat> this is a word that you use for fake gold versus real gold. I want you to Put me under the heat and test whether or not I'm really what I say I am. That, this word, uh, uh, bohan, is not an easy word for example. It's not just, hey, look at my life. This is, hey, put my life under the scrutiny of the hot lights and you're going to find what? He says, examine me, O Lord, try me. Test my mind and my heart. When, when you ask that, you're saying, I'm allowing you to search my real intentions for what I'm doing. I'm allowing you to say, am I real or am I just a hypocrite putting on a show? And then he says in the second half, test my mind and my heart. This word nasal is actually the word for to, to bring in the um, melted material to, uh, to an assayer's office to determine that it is in fact gold. I want you to put the hot lights on me, examine me. Then I want you to smelt my life with trouble and I want it to come up and I want you to actually lay it out in a professional manner and see whether it's possible that I'm not what you, I, I say I am. Because David allowed God to establish the priorities in his life. He says, I have walked in your truth. What does that mean? It means I've examined what you've said and I have walked according to the way of what you've said and I have not varied from it. You know, I wish I could say verses one and two in my life. Don't you? Don't you wish you could say, God, look at every area of my life. I have totally surrendered and I'm walking properly. Uh, maybe, maybe you can. Maybe there's a light shining around you. So, like, oh, you know, I don't know. But I got to tell you, that's a, that's a tough setup. That's tough. You look at everything you want. Turn over anything you want in, in, in my life and you won't find anything but obedience. Then he says in, in the, the last part of verse 2, Test my mind, my heart. He allowed God to see every facet of his decision making. Every part of it. To make sure he wasn't justifying things. Remember that the easiest person to lie to in your life is you. You can lie to yourself and you can make yourself believe that wrong is right. You can, you can literally look at a, a guy who's cheating on you and swear he's really a good guy and he's really probably not doing that even though it's pretty obvious that he is. You can be the last person in the room that knows how stupid you're being. Because we lie to ourselves and we have the ability to do that. And it's actually not even hard to do. So he says, I want you to look over my life and I want you to know that while you're looking it over, you have my permission to test me. And in doing so, I want you to realize that, that, that you can see every facet. I, I, I want you to go on and see where it says, your loving kindness is before my eyes and I have walked in your truth. David has a way of saying, I know where I've been. Go to verse 4. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I think what's interesting is David says, you know what? I am not led astray. I know who I'm spending my time with. I know what I'm listening to. And then it says, I hate the assembly of evildoers. By the way, it doesn't say I hate evildoers. 
It says, I hate the assembly of evildoers. In other words, it's not the people that he hates. It's the outcome of what they're doing. It's the assembly. It's the, the voice of the, of the many that's coming out that he, that he, that he hates. And he says, I will, I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence. By the way, the word wicked here is the word for people who are scoffing at God. It's not just people who do wrong stuff. <clears throat> it's people that publicly proclaim that wrong stuff is right stuff. I'm not going to be with a group of people who are marching against God. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm not for what they're for, and I won't be a part of their group. And then, then he says, he's, he goes to the end, and he says, um, he says that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. I wash my hands in innocence. I go about your altar that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders. He says, look, right now in my life, if you look at my life, I not only absent myself from this group of people, it's not just about what I don't do. Holiness is about what I do. I choose to spend my time offering thanksgiving and praise and being clean and walking into a place where I can be together with you instead of being with people who are scoffing at you. And you go, well, okay, I get that. But then it says this, O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed. He goes to a fifth thing. He says, not only do I want you to vindicate and examine and try and test, I now want you not to take away my soul. I need more time. He pleads with him for more time. He says, I do not want my breath snatched away. I need more time. Why? He says, nor my life with the men of bloodshed in whose hands is a wicked scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. He believes somebody's literally going to kill him. By the way, I think a great place to place this is the time that we're studying in 1 Samuel 19. I think this is a great place to put this song. David is going, don't let them kill me. I think he thinks he's going to be killed. And I think he thinks that because Saul wants his head and he knows it. It says, um, as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. By the way, the um, stanzas break down here as 1 to 7 and 8 to 11. And 1 to 7 looks really long, but it's actually quite short. The, the words that are used are quite short. So 1 to 7, 8 to 11. So the way this sings is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 12, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's how you sing it. And the chorus is sung both times in, in 12. The, he says, I don't want you to take away my life. Give me more time. He says, I want you to redeem me. Podal is an admission of guilt. He says, um, I want you to redeem me. Do you see redeem? Redeem is the word for, I admit that uh, my life is not without sin. I admit that right now, if you go back in my past, you will find things that are wrong. Not that I'm walking in them. I'm walking rightly before you, but I have stains left over in the carpet of my life from before. I need you to ransom or to redeem. Padal is an admission of guilt and an expectation that ransom would be paid. I need you to pay off the back stains of my life. And I need you to be gracious to me. Chonan is the word to sit as a beggar and ask for a morsel of food by somebody when you don't deserve it. So at the end, be gracious to me. So I picked out vindicate, examine, try, test, give me more time, pay for my stains, be gracious, give me a morsel. And I see those seven things as the way in which his perspective is right before God because he steps back and he goes, I'm not saying I've been perfect. I'm saying right now I'm walking with you and everything I can I'm giving to you. Keep me alive because I need you to be able to show grace in my life. I need more time. That's a great song. Everybody get the flavor of the song? The, the point of it is when we focus on God's purpose and we focus on God's sovereign right and we understand Saul's not in charge, God's in charge. We can flee to God Trouble doesn't come simply because you're in the proximity of bad men. Troubles come because you have left the proximity of God's spirit. You can walk through bad men walking with God. You get away from God, that's when trouble comes.
Real trouble isn't about people trying to hurt you. Real trouble is about you not trying to walk with God. That's real trouble.